Well, I suppose it all began when I was a kid, really. I can remember my dad coming home and telling us stories of things he'd seen. And then he'd take me to places where I could see these things as well. Embankments, cuttings, entrances to tunnels. And then a bit of usual books and photos passed around at school. You know, like, like kids do. And then a couple of friends said, would I like to try the real thing? I said, yes. From then on, well, I admit it, I was hooked. I must say I do like railways. Perhaps not quite as much as I did 25 years ago. Then my idea of total happiness was to stand on Sheffield Midland Station at the end of a rain-soaked platform with a notebook, a pencil, a soggy pork pie and a bottle of Tizer. I wonder, will the journey I'm setting out on today mean as much to me now as it would have done then? When to travel the length of Britain by rail was a golden, inaccessible dream. Well, we'll see. Bye. I'm going to Kyle of Lochalsh in northwest Scotland, and I've decided to go all the way by train, just because it's still possible, I suppose, and to find out if there is anything of the train spotter left in me. I've got my old spotter's book, Ian Allen ABC for 1955. Every engine I saw was neatly underlined. Lady Godiva, Seychelles. Howard of Effingham. Still, mustn't get sentimental. Railways nowadays have to be practical and cost-effective. Which is why St Pancras Station of the 1860s looks like this, and Euston Station of the 1960s looks like this. Euston always reminds me of a giant bath. Lots of smooth, slippery marble and glass surfaces so that people can be sloshed quickly and efficiently around. All 65,000 of them daily to 200 destinations from London to the north of Scotland. For the 12.55, calling at Stafford, Crewe, Wilmslow, Stockport and Manchester Piccadilly. The body car is situated in the centre of the train. You're not encouraged to linger in the new streamlined Euston. That's why there aren't any seats. They don't want people sticking to the sides of the bar. You just check your ticket and off down the plug hole. There's not much to see down here, is there? I've taken the tea rooms and the bars and the barbers away from the trains. And why not? What are engines nowadays anyway? Just machines to get you from A to B? Then I wonder why they still give them names. There's one other reminder of the old-style railways still left at Euston. The Manchester Pullman. Last survivor of luxury travel. For first-class fare, plus a bit more, you can still get pampered with waiter service at every table throughout the journey. It's definitely the way to travel. Or, if the BBC are paying, you can just watch it. Secure in the knowledge that Pullmans won't be with us for much longer. In the age of the train, it's going to be intercity for everyone. The start of a train journey, one of the great sensations of life. 
It's hard to believe I'll be on railway lines from here to the Isle of Skye. It's a pity they don't call trains like this expresses anymore. Now it's all service on a network. But they have tried to keep the human touch. reason for the seven minute late start from Houston this morning, they had not got a guard for the train. Personally, I'm not on duty until half past ten, but I happen to be at Houston a bit early. Coffee. Yes, please, I think so. I need something. It's going so slowly today. Ah, oh, like the max box. Uh, no, I'll just have the coffee, please. It's 21. 21. How many more trips you got to do today on this train? Two. Two. Yes. So you go up to Manchester and then back down to Houston again. Do you? No, we go back to from Manchester, go back to London, then back to yeah. Liverpool. Ah, okay. What time do they start in the morning? Quarter to six. Well, that's when you have to get to the uh, get to the train. When you have to get up. Yeah. Really? Quarter to six. Half past four to get up. Oh, well, I hope the coffee's good. Yeah. There's nothing in it. Along this stretch was set one of British Railway's many world records. The record for lifting large sums of money out of railway trains. In 1963, the night mail was relieved here of two and a quarter million pounds. Enough for 600,000 away days to Brighton. This was the first big refreshment stop outside London, in the days before they put food on trains when they had to serve entire expressfuls in ten minutes flat. A large brown winter. Uh, can you read for ten, please? Devil kicked, please. Got them muffins. Eighteen teeth, quickly. A crate of steak for twenty-four glasses, please. <laughs> You'd have to move pretty fast to get a sausage roll nowadays. hundred miles an hour now as we pass the Grand Junction Canal, built 33 years before they opened this railway. It's really no wonder the canal owners hated the railways. They had, after all, spent rather a lot of money on what was rapidly becoming Britain's shortest-lived transport revolution. But 130 years later, the railways themselves had to fight an even bigger threat. Who needed crowded, unpunctual trains when you could drive from London to Birmingham in a couple of hours? But now the M1 itself is overcrowded. And with the canals undergoing a popular revival and the railways electrified, the talk's all of an integrated transport system. So nobody won. Someone once told me that engine drivers are unofficially instructed to go to full speed whenever they're running alongside a main road. It's a nice story. Crew, a train spotter's dream. In 1841, it was one farmhouse. Since then, Crew has built thousands of locomotives and miles of rolling stock, and in common with other great railway towns like Darlington and Doncaster, runs a football team that's almost permanently at the bottom of the fourth division. Despite the horrors painted by the early opposition to railways, of hens ceasing to lay and pregnant women miscarrying and pheasants dying before they could be shot, Technological progress in the early 19th century was unstoppable. Thirty miles from Jodrell Bank, the world's first regular passenger railway service began on September the 15th, 1830. It ran between Liverpool and Manchester, and this is a replica of the engine that made it all possible. George Stevenson's rocket. Built in 1829, it started a love affair that's lasted ever since.
I suppose true railway buffs love all engines. Short, fat, squat, long, rumbling, smelly diesels or swiftly silent electrics. But most of all, they love steam. And the most famous steam engine of them all is Flying Scotsman. Built in 1923, retired in 1963 and still going strong. The first locomotive to 100 miles an hour. I really couldn't miss this trip. And I'm not the only one either. She's like an old film star now. Everything she says is faithfully recorded. Every inch of her body explored by a thousand lenses. Is it just us who are like this? And the British, I mean. Are there any train spotters in Sicily? Do Belgians go misty-eyed at the thought of seeing the 1216 to Antwerp? Do Swedes save up all year for a Hasselblad to photograph a Stockholm to Gothenburg coal train breasting a 1 in 57 gradient? I think perhaps the root of the love affair lies in the cab. This is where the important people travel. Bill McAlpine, whose money keeps Flying Scotsman going. And beside him, the driver and the fireman, recreating the days when physical human effort drove railway trains. And these are their fans. Yeah, I'm trying to identify those two stations, actually. It's a very simple tape recorder. Yeah. I'm recording the sound of the locomotive. Yeah. Throughout the journey. Throughout most of the journey, yes. Um, on the downhill stretches, you don't hear very much, but you get the best recordings when she's pulling. When do you when do you play these? Do you sort of sit at home and, and, and play well, these in the evening? Yeah. Stereophonic locomotives yeah. steaming through the house at all times at the weekend. <laughs> I think it's great to be able to travel on a train like this, the Flying Scotsman. I'm 71 years of age and I used to, this is my only way of travelling in my younger days, was travelling on steam trains. And I think it's one of the nicest days I've had out today. It's brought back memories, <laughs> great memories too. Oh, it's uh, travelling behind steam, flying Scotsman, reliving the age of steam of yesteryear, reminding me of many journeys of my, my youth and days in the Air Force. It's a, a living machine that uh, has a tremendous attraction for me. I just like hearing it and seeing it work, particularly travelling with them, but follow them wherever I can, as much as the money will allow. It's sight, sound and emotion. You like the look of the wheels going round and the, uh, the motion of the driving wheels going round and you also enjoy the sound of it and the sight of it going along. It's a magnificent feeling and people have love affairs with steam engines. Have you always been interested in railways throughout your life? Very nearly. There was a, a short period when uh, I became interested in girls at the usual age and eventually I got married and then uh, I went back to railways again and combined a happily married life with uh, playing trains. Literally thousands of people have turned out today to watch us all playing trains and to stare a little enviously at the lucky hundreds inside happily watching themselves being stared at. <laughs> Wensleydale Cheddar. And the even luckier few at the back of the train who've spurned packed lunches in order to say that they've eaten a four-course meal behind Flying Scotsman. What could be nicer than sipping large gin and tonics through the Yorkshire coal fields? I've been queen for a day. Now I know what our queen feels like. All these beautiful people and uh, their joy on their faces when they saw us coming. It's tremendous what has happened. We've forgotten all about the steam train, haven't we? Thank <laughs> you. 
Manchester to York in 1980, but the image could be any time in the last 60 years. It's an enduring image of England, the sort that made the Englishman abroad go misty-eyed in the evenings and reach sadly for the whisky bottle. It's the England of Thomas the Tank Engine and the railway children, when the trains were always friendly. <laughs> So the Scotsman, having satisfied her faithful audience with yet another Oscar-winning performance, strolls in rather leisurely fashion to a curtain call at York. With its superb curving roof, 800 feet long and over 100 years old, York Station holds its own with the daunting array of great buildings outside the Norman Cathedral, the City Wall, and the National Railway Museum. Definitely worth missing a train for. Not just preserved locos, but preserved seats, signs, posters, toys, teacups, buttons, and other bits of the railway age. Is that a replica of the crown, do you suppose, uh, in this particular case? Oh, indeed. With the lions and the horses, the unicorns. I wonder who Stevenson was. I hope the Americans haven't missed this one over here. It's called Agenoria, and its sister engine, Stourbridge Lion, was exported to the USA in 1829 to be the first steam locomotive ever to run on the American continent. Which type can go further without refueling the tank or the tender? Tender, Alistair, that's correct. Remember you to circle it. And which type is better for short distance work? Yes. The tank, that's great. Mallard, still the world's fastest steam locomotive. With the help of Sir Nigel Gresley's streamlining, it reached 126 miles an hour in July 1938. The golden age of steam is preserved here in aspic, perhaps, but with care and love and respect. Not all Britain steam engines were retired quite so gracefully. There are engines here that I would have waited all day to see when I was a train spotter. Celtic, one of the big diesels built to replace steam in 1962. They still go through York and I could have caught one to Scotland, but I wanted to see what railways are like away from the main lines. Well, some of them have been dug up, like the one I wanted to travel on now between York and Pickering. 
The end of steam also meant the end for 5,000 miles of track, sacrificed by Dr. Beeching in order to save the rest of the system. But not everyone let their trains go that easily. It was just a big heap of rust with no, yeah. no copper pipes, no fittings, absolutely nothing. It was just, just rust, no paint or anything. And did you have to get These are the workshops of the North York Moors Railway. It's hard to believe what's going on here. It's like being in a time warp. Yeah. And what actually goes on in here? Is this where they're sort of put together and taken apart? That's right, yeah. Now you, amongst other things, you're obviously taking the wheels off this locomotive. Why are these being removed? Well, they're uh, getting slightly worn now. Yeah. Obviously, metal on metal wears eventually. Yeah. And they've been taken out to be turned. Yeah. What happens on, you know, with locomotives like this and, and restoring, say, a cab like that. Where do you get the spare parts? Some we make ourselves, others we have to buy either as rough castings or as complete units. How much would a locomotive like this cost when it, when it comes here, in, in its sort of present state? Well, this particular one, I believe, cost about uh, three to four thousand pounds off British railways. And how much, once you've got to work on it and all your mob, I mean, what would it be worth then? Well, once it's in first-class condition, it could be worth anything up to eighty, ninety thousand pounds, depending on who wants to buy it. Yeah. And people are buying locomotives for eighty, ninety thousand pounds. Yes, indeed. There's uh, one up for sale at the moment for ninety thousand. If That's anybody's good. interested. <laughs> and you do this work, and it's really dirty, and it's fairly grimy, and it's fairly messy. Yeah. I mean, why do you do it? Why do you spend so much time with with uh, locomotives? The enjoyment of it. Yeah. I don't really know why I do it. I'm just. Is it steam? Mad about steam engines. Thank you very much, sir. Great. Thank you. Thanks for that. Hello. Uh, to the end of the line, please. Where's that? Uh, Gromont Junction. Gromont Junction. How A far? single. Yes, please. How far is it? 18 miles. Ah. Oh. You don't go anywhere near Edinburgh? I'm afraid not. Uh, no. OK. Let's take that. <laughs> North York Moors Railway was opened by the Duchess of Kent four years after Dr. Beeching closed it. There are 67 other privately owned lines in Britain. And between them they've saved 300 miles of track and nearly 500 steam locomotives. This is also one of the oldest lines in the country, engineered by the same man who built Rocket, George Stevenson. Quite a difficult route and Stevenson had to improvise quite ingeniously. For instance, when it came to carrying the line over marshy ground, his solution was to stitch animal skins together, fill them with ballast and literally float the line on top. It still works and still carries passengers. We come up twice a year, the beginning of the season, about end of May, June and then August, September time. The season, what's that, the railway spotting season? Yes. Or? Yes, and also the holiday season as well. We don't get so many holiday makers, you know, it tends to be quiet. That regularly? What, twice oh, a yes, year? yes, twice a year, every year. And how many years have you been doing that? Mm, about 16. Really? Yes, yes. Why, I mean, is it just this railway that draws you all railway? Well, we sort of combine a holiday in Whitby, Robin Hood's Bay, with the railway as well. Yeah. But um, we go train spotting all around the country during the year as well. So. One bonus for me on this line is the sight of my favourite steam engine of all, the Stania Black Fives. <laughs> They were the stock in trade of my local station in Sheffield. Unpretentious, straightforward and hard working. Thank you. 
really is a marvellous line and it was very reluctantly that I left it to go back to British Rail reality. Ah, the familiar cry of the lesser spotted DMU. DMU is short for Diesel Multiple Units. Although many of these are operating years beyond their planned lifespan, they're the mainstay of British Rail's running headache, the politely termed rural services. Mind you, if we're going to have a national rail network at all, then it's lines like these that have to be kept alive. This is the Esk Valley Line, running through beautiful countryside from Whitby to Middlesbrough, from a seaside town to an important city in the centre of a large industrial area. Its closure was recommended by Beeching, but it survived. There have been plenty of closure scares since up here, and these country lines outside the world of the intercity network have never been allowed the luxury of feeling secure. approaching Battersby Junction and here the driver without stopping has to hand in his token. It's a safety precaution. No one can enter a stretch of single line working unless they've been given the token by the token man to the or in this case the token woman. Oh yeah. Are there many other sort of signal signal ladies? Uh, yes, there's two of us in this bunch. Really? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you all get together sort of separately? <laughs> <No. laughs> it's quite hard. Uh, working one of these. Physically, yeah, it's quite hard, yes. Is there a knack? Can I, I mean, I've never never uh, actually operated a signal in my life. Could I have a go? Yeah, sure. Because I've got to catch a train in a minute. I've got a moment. Yeah. Which one, which one shall I do? Um, just a moment. Whitby Branch Passenger Dock, FP Dock. You're all really impressive. I don't want to start a major derailment or anything, so... <laughs> right, if you put, number, you put number one. No, number, number one, one yeah. right. So what do I do? Just... <laughs> Let this off here, and then... Oh, I see what you mean. Oh. Oh. Not very elegant, was that, really? <laughs> Try it again. Whoa! Whoa! It was only 20 miles from here that railways were born. In 1824, a Quaker businessman believed enough in George Stevenson to put up the money for a line to carry coal between Darlington and Stockton. It opened on the 27th of September, 1825. It was the first railway journey ever. Some of the achievements of that great day still exist. Like Skern Bridge. Which is still carrying trains using the same gauge that Stevenson chose for his railway that day. Believe it or not, even the engine itself can still be seen. Locomotion dazzled the world at a speed of eight miles an hour. 
Now, after 155 years of evolution, the engine looks like this. The world's fastest diesel express, the Intercity 125, the high-speed train. Flying Scotsman took eight hours from London to Edinburgh. The Deltic cut this down to six, and now the high-speed train can take you from capital to capital in four hours and 37 minutes. And it's air-conditioned. I used to, um, I was in Sheffield, but none of the main lines, I always seem to miss Sheffield. So there's about eight engines that seem to come through, or that was all we had, Just keep in various sort of permutations. But it was, uh, yeah, it was a lockout. It's a long way, it's train spotting, because I know there's... Well, he didn't, you see, really, because he didn't have the money. I didn't have the money to go far. The sort of places I'm going to on this journey and staying in hotels which are right out over stations, I mean, oh, it would be an absolute dream, you know, going to the moon if it was a train spot. Just sit up in the hotel room with a book. When you pass a place like Durham, you realise how much Victorian railway engineers changed everything. This famous view of the city wouldn't have been possible before 1869, when the railway viaduct was built high above it. Tyneside, where George Stevenson experimented with his first locomotives. 170 years later, Tyneside could be giving railways a lead again. This is the Metro, Newcastle's gleaming new local railway system, equipped with the very latest in computer controls, electronic surveillance, vandal-proof stations. Control to one zero at two. Confirm your position. Over. If it all works, it could do for local railways what high-speed trains are doing nationally. Leaving Newcastle, someone told me there was once talk of naming the high-speed train sets. As they have a locomotive at either end, some wags suggested they should be named after famous couples like David and Goliath or Laurel and Hardy, Castor and Pollux. Which is fine if they never broke down, but with a little juggling in the workshops you might see Laurel and Pollux on the ten o'clock, or Spencer and Castor. Mind you, Goliath and Hardy sounds rather an interesting act. The foot plate. Well, the the younger end would, would yes, prefer to call it the cab because of nothing else. But the older end, it's still the foot plate, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, we still refer to the foot plate. Sometimes the cab. Is there a very different sort of spirit to uh, to driving uh, the, these HSTs now? I mean, amongst the men, because I would imagine with firing and driving a steam engine, there's very much sort of feeling of teamwork and getting it through by your own sort of sweat and muscle. Well, right? oh, that's, that's a, there's, a, there's a big thing to say about that. Um, you know, say, say, you've got an engine which wasn't steaming very well. Yeah. I wasn't, you know, um, I mean, these things, you just open the throttle and yeah. that's it, if it'll not do it, well, that's it. Yeah. But you've got an engine that wasn't steaming very well because different different steam engines had different characteristics. Yeah. Some you had to fire with a, with a big heavy fire. Yeah. Others you had to fire with a very light fire. Yeah. See? Now you'll notice, as we approach a green light, about 200 yards this side of it, you'll hear a bell. Modern signalling is more difficult than the old signalling, because you'll take dark or fog, all you can see are green lights. Yeah. Now a green light is a green light is a green light. Yeah. With the semaphore signals, you, they all have their own characteristics, haven't they? You know, this gantry meant you were passing songs, or this gantry meant... A green light's a green light. Oh, I see. The individual gantry meant well, exactly. you could relate that to the place you were passing. They have to know yes. exactly where they are in fog. Regarding landmarks, not only what they can see, what we could hear, what we could smell, and how we cut off from the outside world, apart from the speed of it. But that all sounds as though it's a rather, uh, rather a dull job now, being a being an engine driver. It used to be the envy. Everyone wanted to be an engine driver. I mean, is it is it oh, more is it? boring now? Oh no, no, I don't. Think. You can't, it's not get boring because you've got something to do all the time. I mean, if, if, I, if I miss that fresh me foot there when that goes, yeah. the brakes go on. You see, you've only got uh, a second and a half. Yeah. Same as with this one. If that one goes, it 
you do, when you got a second and a half to press up, I don't press up then, you a second and a half, break for one, you come in there, you can't get them off. It takes two minutes. Oh really? That's right. So that's minutes. the fail-safe system, that the brakes will go off. If you don't correct any of these yes, devices, the, the train will come to a halt and stop for two minutes. Yeah. And now how, we're speeding up a bit now, we're getting up yeah. to... We're getting 100 miles an hour. We're getting 100 miles an hour. The East Coast Main Line, one of the classic routes, along the Northumbrian cliffs, up towards Berwick and across the border into Scotland. So at last to Edinburgh. Let's have a look in the guidebook, shall we? Edinburgh. The Athens of the North, home of Burns and Scott and Robert Louis Stevenson, of Prince's Street and the Royal Palace of Holyrood, nestling beneath the extinct volcano they call Arthur's Seat. As if inspired by the castle above them, Edinburgh's buildings strive for an impression of grandeur. Ah, this sounds good. The railway hotels are amongst the finest of them. The Caledonian at one end of Prince's Street and at the other, the noble North British, where the weary traveller can get his first taste of the graciousness of this fine city. 392 miles from London, 262 still to go. Mm. Won't be a high-speed train through the Highlands, though, probably a couple of Class 47s. <laughs> I suppose I was lucky to get a bath. It's festival time here in Edinburgh and the place is packed. I love these railway hotels. They reflect confidence on an epic scale. Nowadays, we're used to people apologising for the railways. But when this was built in 1903, the big railway companies spent money like water, securing the knowledge that they had transport absolutely sewn up. The result is corridors big enough for cricket matches, stairs wide enough for Busby Barclay musicals, and a lobby big enough for the Battle of Culloden. At this time of year, there are 335 people cleaning their teeth every morning at the North British, and the trouser pressing service is going berserk. Everybody wants to be out doing things and seeing things. I've got a clock that wakes me every morning for my train. I've got a show full of sparkling drive. Thank you. I have removed the worker's worker card, which leaves her unemployed. The choice of where to go is almost impossible, unless you're a train spotter, of course. Uh, what's the train for Cardiff La Calche? Please. Well, you'll have to change it in Vanessa. Oh, I see. I can't go straight through to Cardiff La Calche. No, you have to change it in Vanessa. Wait, when's, the, when's the train to Vanessa? Train for Inverness is 09.45 in the morning, number 17. OK. Please All right, yeah. Train Thanks train very much. Thanks a lot. Cheerio. <laughs> Thank you.
The biggest show of all is up at the castle, the Edinburgh Military Tattoo. It's a noisy, glittering, stirring Scottish spectacular. And this year it's not only the men who are in skirts. Mind you, I didn't hear a thing. I was having this wonderful dream. Even in the age of Concord and moon buggies and microprocessors, I defy anyone to be unmoved by the fourth railway bridge. It was built at the end of the last century. And if you want to make one for yourself, the recipe is 54,160 tonnes of steel 740,000 tonnes of granite, 48,400 cubic yards of stone, 64,300 cubic yards of concrete, 21,000 tonnes of cement and six and a half million rivets. And all this was built in an age when the only alternative to railways was a horse and trap. It's only when you're over the fourth bridge that Scotland really seems to begin. We're on the Highland Line now, which goes up through Perth and beyond. And though it goes over the highest summits and the bleakest moors on British Rail, 100 miles of it were built in less than two years. Victorian energy and railway navvies. Inverness. I'm 180 miles north of Edinburgh now, 700 miles by rail and taxi since I left London. And I still haven't seen the word Kyle, of, or Lockhouse on a railway timetable. But Inverness is the last change, so I might be in luck. Ah, there we are. Hmm. Oh. Four hours to kill. I'm afraid I'm one of those travellers who gets rather twitchy about leaving stations when I know there's a connection in the offing. But four hours is four hours, and I think it's probably good for a railway filiac like myself to occasionally tear himself away from trains, do a bit of sightseeing, buy a souvenir of old Inverness and generally see what normal people do around here. Which is what brought me to my first Highland Games. I always thought they were huge affairs, but this one's quite cosy, really. It's a local occasion, very friendly, but they do seem to have 20 or 30 events going on simultaneously, which looks a bit dangerous. I don't know how many Highland dancers get killed by flying hammers in a year, or tug-of-war teams decimated by shot putters, or spectators squashed by freshly tossed cabers,
Mind you, one of these contestants was especially interesting. A caber-tossing railwayman from the Kyle of Lacalche line. What do you do at the station? Uh, work in the booking office. Uh, mainly deal with partials and, and uh, signal duties and uh, various things. What do you... I mean, I'm going to see the line. What, what do you think of the line itself? It's... Oh, it's a beautiful line. Uh, very scenic, uh, very busy at this time of year. The railway to the Kyle of Lockhouse. In summer, a converted 1897 restaurant car serves as an observation coach. The entire On the right hand side, we have the Black Isle. Now, the Black Isle got its name from when the Norsemen came over here. They stole and plundered, and before they left, they burnt everything behind them. Here, devotees of fine landscape can see, and courtesy of a special British Rail guide, hear about the passing delights. Bewley got its name when the Mary Queen of Scots stayed here a night, and when she awoke in the morning, she remarked what a beautiful place, coming from the French word Bewley, meaning beautiful place, so hence its name Bewley. cars as luxurious as this in, in, in the States? I've never ridden on a train in the States. You've never ever been on a train in the States? Jean McKenzie, on the other hand, has been travelling this line since the year it opened, 1897. I went in here to my very boot, to a big, one of my beans, big boot, and took me to stroll. And then I went on to, and we made some glass. Ah, and, and this, when, when was that? How many years ago? Oh, that was and I was 14. How old are you now? Oh, damn. Yes. I'm only 99. Only 99? Only. Oh, <laughs> a slip of a girl. <laughs> oh. They call this the skyline, and it runs through some of the most gloomily beautiful country in the world. Country which looks and sounds as if it's out of Tolkien, with names like the Valley of Drizzle and Raven Rock and the Black Water. The locks and lonely crags and empty moors it passes through are thick with legends of giants and beasts. And one particularly fearsome witch known in the trade as Hairy Agnes. Honestly, says so in a British Rail brochure. The last ten miles to the Kyle, which looks so deceptively idyllic, took four years to blast out of solid rock. There are a few lines in the whole of Britain which were as hard won as these. Then quite suddenly we're at the end of the line, the end of the journey. In three hours and ten minutes we've crossed Scotland from the North Sea to the Atlantic. Along the station dozens of backpacks rise into the air like a medieval army preparing for battle. This is, believe it or not, Kyle of La Calche. And there, 785 and a half railway miles from Euston, is the Isle of Skye. And now, I think I deserve to buy myself a drink.
morning, sir. Oh, good morning, sir. Well, yes, thank you very much. What a beautiful place for a hangover. It's just so, oh, so terribly, terribly Scottish. Still, I suppose I didn't come here just to look at the scenery. Kalsh, at last, ready to collect it after breakfast. It's not that I want to go, but I've got an appointment by 10 o'clock. Now, if they ever do a series on great breakfast table views of the world, how about this one? I suppose there can't be that many people who come to such a beautiful and remote corner of northwest Scotland just to keep a business appointment, especially on a four day train journey. But there are priceless objects in the Kyle of Localche which you can't get anywhere else. Now then, where was it? Past the post office, telephone box on the right, and there we are. Uh, Michael Phelan from London. Oh, right. pleased yeah. to meet you, Mr. You Phelan. Did you? Yes, 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 sure. It all arrived okay. Have you, uh, have you got it ready for me? Yes, you? I've got it all ready for you. I don't know quite whether you realise how big it is, though. Oh, it doesn't matter how big it is, you know, as long as it's there. Oh, great moment, this. There we are. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. That's beautiful. It's big, isn't it? It is a little bit, isn't it? <laughs> it's in the bedroom wall, but this is, uh, oh, I think... another three houses. That's uh, it. Oh, great. Uh, I'm going to get this back. Well, we can send it down on the train for you. There's one leaving in about an hour. I can put it on there, no problem. Well, the thing was, I wanted to go on the on the other line, the West Highland line. Oh, yes, on yeah, it, yeah. I've done this one. Yeah, yeah. So how, how do I get to the West Highland well, line? Well, just go over on the ferry to Calacan, yeah. and you can get a bus from there to Armadale. Then you can get the ferry from Armadale across to Malay. You can pick the train up there, down through Fort William to Glasgow, no problem. Great. So, uh, ferry from Kyle to Skye. So uh, bus across Sky yeah. to Armadale, uh -huh. ferry Armadale to Malag. That's it. Pick up the train at Malag for Glasgow. That's it. You got okay, it. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks very much indeed. Okay Come then. On. Right. That's fine. Thank you. Bye bye. Kyle of Localche, my very own station sign. Now there's only four thousand seven hundred twenty-eight left to get. You see, train spotting is all about collecting, whether it's numbers or southern region buttons or the sounds of flying Scotsmen. It's wanting to have a part of something which is, for better or worse, in your blood. I've discovered on this journey that my love affair with railways never really did end. And I don't suppose it ever will. Now, where are we going? 560 miles back to Euston. Mm, through Fort William. Go past Ben Nevis, over Glenfin and Viaduct. Right across Rangapore, past the highest station in Britain, and past Loch Lomond. 